Hello, and welcome to Darkly Lit, where we are just aliens trying to fit in with the rest of the factory. I am your host, Kayla King. I'm joined by my other two co-hosts. We have Sade. Combat moi. <laughs> and my other co-host, David. I don't know what you guys were talking about. This sour docs were actually pretty good. Mm. And welcome to the newest season of Darkly Lit, everyone. Woo! We're here. It's the first episode of our six-part season. Yeah, the new format begins now, properly. This is exciting. Uh, Gracie agrees. <laughs> Gracie didn't read the book, though. I totally forgot that it was, like, new season time. It was just kind of like... for Okay, for everyone else, it's been a little bit. For us, it's just kind of like, well, no, I guess it has been a bit. I don't know. Time is such a blur. Welcome to the new format! <laughs> yeah! Yay. And we are starting things off with Earthlings by Sayaka Murata. Notes can be found in the description about the uh, content warning for this episode. The story begins with our protagonist, Natsuki, who is 11 years old, and she doesn't really fit in with her family. I mean, it's more than that, but um, her parents are much more favorable to her sister, and they keep saying how useless she is. It's basically child abuse. I'm yeah. not going to lie. They put her down. They really treat her like shit, and she has low self-esteem as a result of it. However, uh, she has a quote-unquote secret. She has a plush toy of a hedgehog named, I, forgive me for saying this incorrectly, Poyot? Puyut? It was a Piyut in the uh, audio. Piyut. 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 Awesome. I didn't listen to the audio book. I actually read it, so I appreciate that. Uh, so her hedgehog plush toy, Piute, has come from the planet Poppin Po Poppin Pun Poppia. Poppin Pun Poppia. Poppin Pop Poppin Pop Poppy. Pop Pop Pop. Sorry. Poppin Pop Pop Poppy. I was gonna I was gonna ask you about because I know you listen because I read it with more of a, a long O Popin Pop Popin Po Bopia, but I guess Poppin. It was Poppin Pon Poppia in in at least in the audiobook. Poppin Pon Poppia. Poppin Pon Boppia. Poppin Pon Poppia. Poppin Pon Boppia. Poppin Pon Poppia. Pop and bond poppia. <laughs> pop and pop poppia. I am keeping this all There's in a pee of in us. There, it is. It is. I hear it's... a pee. I, I keep hearing pop and pop poppia. And I'm like, no, it, what, isn't it pop and pop pop it's, boppia? So it's spelled P O P I N P O B O P I A. It sounded like it was all P's in the audio. So pop and pop. <laughs> however you want pop it. Pop and pop boppia. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. Pop and pop. Plant and. <laughs> I'm going to call it Planet Poppin'. Uh, <laughs> hey, hey gang, this podcast is really popping off. <laughs> and has said that she is a, a girl with magical powers, and it's her job to save the Earth. During a summer trip with uh, her family to um, the mountains of uh, Nagano, where her grandparents live in the forest, and this is basically our main location for most of the story, or like it's a very central location for most of the story. Mm. She tells her secret to her cousin Yu, and then Yu confides that he says, funny enough, I'm an alien as well. And she's like, you are? And he said, yeah, his mom always said that he was an alien. And the chief wonders to herself, maybe you're from Planet Poppin'. How, now, they're 11 years old, and they're cousins, and she asks, like, can you be my boyfriend? And he says yes. And when this first starts out, it's, it's very innocent and cute. It doesn't get innocent and cute. It doesn't stay that way long. After that summer, she, in her hometown, she's dealing with a lot of shit. Oh boy. This, it, like, this gets tough. So along with being abused by her family, she is also being sexually abused by her teacher. And there is a point where he does take her to his house and force her to perform fellatio on him. And she's 11. Yeah. It, it gets it gets tough, people. Mm -hmm. And then this does affect her mentality. And you can really see how much the world around her, this forcing of what she says that everybody wants her to be part of this baby factory or factory. And that she knows she has to fit in and has to belong. So they end up going back to Nagano because her, her grandfather passed away. And they have to go there for their funeral. And it's there that um, she goes to see you and asks you to sleep with her. Again, they are 11. 
Well, I think at this point they're 12, right? Like, this is a year later. Yeah, they're still 12. Or, they're still young, though. Yeah, no, it's, I mean, I'm not trying to split hairs. It's just, I'm just trying to make sure the timeline makes sense. Yeah. So. I think uh, there is a point, if I remember that they ended up back in Nagano at one point, because she, they do a their own marriage ceremony. What it was is, we're, when we're, when we start the book, they're on their way to Nagano, and we have a brief recap where Natsuki asks you to be her boyfriend, but on this trip that we are starting with, at the start of the book is when she's like, no, marry me. And that's when they do their marriage little ceremony. When they go back a year later, not for, for Oban, for like the family tradition they do every year, but for the death of the grandfather, that's when she's like, hey, we got to fuck. <laughs> yeah. It's basically because she knows that this, they may not come back up here. Cause again, they favor her sister and her sister hates being in this location and they spoil her sister and give her what she wants. And she says, I'm afraid I won't be able to come back up here. And also, because of all the bad mental treatment she has, she wants to have something positive to remember, I guess, of sex. So she does end up sleeping with him. And unfortunately, the whole family catches them in the morning. And this causes drama to the point that she is taken away and her does not leave her parents' sight for, like, her whole, like, the, her whole teen years. She's forced to go to cram school with the abusive teacher. However, Pute tells her that this teacher has been possessed and he needs to be saved. Then leads to what I can, what all of us can assume is her murdering this abusive teacher. I'll give my feelings on that later on. <laughs> Nobody knows who caused it. They know he was murdered. And everybody is just so in shock. Who would want to kill such a nice young man who was so liked by all his students? She keeps asking Pew, like, did I murder him? And he's telling her, um, you did it. You you did it. You won. You did it. And then eventually he fades, Pew's voice fades away and she doesn't hear it anymore. Uh, she grows up and as a 30 something year old adult, uh, we, we do jump ahead. She is now married to uh, a man named Tomoya, who they're more roommates than they are an actual couple. She found him online and he said, I, uh, my parents are forcing me to marry. I don't want to have sex. I don't want to uh, live with someone, but I kind of just want to get married to get it over with. And that's what they do. They, they meet once and then get married in a courthouse the next day. And her family is happy. Oh, good. Our daughter has finally been married. Doesn't matter if she just met this man. <laughs> now she can continue on with the factory, work and make baby, except baby never comes. And they keep pushing her to be like, where's the baby? Why haven't you ha made baby yet? Her best friend growing up is like, "Why uh, I have baby, why don't you have baby yet? Uh, Natsuki tells Tomoya stories of their uh, her childhood and about um, the house in Nagano. And as Tomoya, as someone who grew up in the city, founds it, finds it to be charming and he asks his mother if he could go there, and then that goes gets back to Natsuki's mother. But since enough time has passed since then, and they realize, you know what, maybe going on this sort of trip to Nagano might can encourage them to actually, you know, make a baby. So that's why she, their, her family supports them going on this trip. However, uh, it turns out her cousin Yu, now all grown up, also is currently living at this cabin. So she, Tomoya, and you all live together and she admits to, Natsuki admits it's like, we're, we're not really a couple, we're just husband and wife, but Natsuki actually did tell her about Plant Poppin and uh, the whole factory and that Tomoya has come to believe that maybe he is an alien too and that he is not of this planet as well. This eventually leads to more drama because he says, you know what, I'm gonna tr try and sleep with my brother. Just because, just to do something out of the ordinary and taboo. And he tries to, and his dad gets upset, Every, his whole family gets upset. And this finally leads to them realizing that Natsuki and Tomoya have never slept together and they get upset. Eventually, they decide, we can't do this anymore. We are leaving, we're escaping the city and living as uh, Pop and Boppias or <laughs> Poppy Boppians. Pop and Pop Boppias. Yes. Boppians. As the aliens that they are. <laughs> as Scatman John intended. Be bop 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 bop. And you joins them and they basically live kind of hippie-ish. Like they're, uh, they're trying to find food. 
uh, they don't work, but and they're exploring the world around them. They don't they don't even like have really sleep together either. They're just it's a very asexual relationship, even even though they walk around naked around each other. And before this, she had a conversation with her sister. Her sister kind of gathered that her that uh, Natsuki may have killed her teacher. Basically, it came out that she that uh, her old, her sister had an affair. She gets mad and tells the family, "Hey, well, Natsuki killed her teacher," and it leads to the teacher's parents to come and attack Natsuki at the house, and they end up murdering him and then eating them because they are hungry and need food. And they're like, "Well, they're not. We're not Earthlings. They are." This is a weird weird book. They end up like biting on each other and eating each other and when they're finally found by the family apparently all of them have swollen bellies and they say we're pregnant and the families are shocked and they're like let us go out into the world and it ends there. This book is beautifully written and it's weird. (laughs) It explains why the summary was like I could see you like I could see you sitting there trying to be like how do I explain this? Yeah, it's there's so much that happens. Where do we even start? What do you guys think about this book? Well, you had started reading it before the the rest of us, um, and you had warned us like, hey, there's there's some incest stuff here, and I was prepared for the worst. I was not prepared for something so wholesome. Uh, at least, <laughs> you know, in terms of, like, you and Natsuki at the beginning. Overall, um... All things considered, I mean, it's not the only real wholesome thing that happened. Well, mm. I don't know. I think they're, like, towards the end, their, like, relationship as, like, not a thruple, but a thruple. <laughs> pump yeah. up and yeah. thruple. Um, <laughs> it, it, it is fascinating, because it's, like, they're, they're technically a thruple, it's like they are in a relationship, but they're not sleeping together. They're all, in fact, divorced from each other. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I thought, overall, this whole book was cute. Um, it was not hard to me at all, even in, in like, the murder. Uh, and there were some problematic scenes. Um, you guys both know, though, that I, like, explore a lot of content like that, because I'm very fascinated by the human psyche when it comes to problematic content. So yeah, there, there's there's some elements here that would definitely cause discomfort for like the general reader. But overall, the whole experience of the book for me was just like very cute and almost kind of like whimsical. Um, whimsical is definitely something that I think it could be attached to a yeah. lot of it because you are seeing it from Natsuki's perspective. And Natsuki is like thinking she's a magical girl at the beginning. And again, we don't know. We can't really separate her from, we can't really separate the reality of the story from her because we're all seeing it from her perspective. Yeah. So it's very unreliable narrative. Yes, for sure. It is. The, I guess the elements that are horrifying is the fact that she is, to cope with all this trauma, has distorted reality to such a level. And it was also, if, if you're like really interested in Japanese culture, this is definitely an interesting book, knowing that it was translated originally from Japanese. Because it speaks a lot to a lot of, like, societal expectations in Japan. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. If you're beyond just enjoying anime and, like, actually, like, dive into Japanese culture a bit, there are a lot of, like, aspects of it that you start to hear about. But you don't really think about it too much as a foreigner. Like, the the whole, like, there's that whole thing in Japan of, like, uh, working yourself to death. Um, I think they even have a name for it. It's, like, Karoshi or something like that. You know, and you see images of, like, like you, you get why, like, Tomoya is, like, I don't want to be part of society. Uh, yeah, no, it's, it was, a lot of it was very, very fascinating. And I overall really enjoyed the book. I, I knew this wouldn't be horrifying to say. <laughs> <laughs> I, but I, I didn't know if, like, I, I'm glad that you did find it interesting, at least. Because I said... It's like, this is definitely horror. I know you, but I'm like, but I don't think Sade will see it as horror. No. Psychologically interesting, yes. I I do see it as psychological horror. There is a psychological, it's just different Mm. from a typical psychological horror It gave me, there were certain scenes where it was giving me perfect blue vibes. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Especially that that part where she was like repeating, pop and pop, pop, yeah, pop and pop, pop, yeah, pop and pop, pop, yeah. I was like, whoa, okay. Yeah, the the whole part where she, um, everything goes pink and Piet is telling her to like destroy the, you know, you have to to defeat the Wicked Witch to save the teacher. Uh And she thinks that she's taking her hand scythe and attacking what looks like a pupa Mm -hmm. and golden light is spilling out of it while she's chanting. And the whole thing is her just disconnected and like 
hat murdering the fuck out of uh, the the teacher, which was one of the best parts, honestly, because I love to see a uh, abusive pedophile get a fucking killed. It's not surprising, honestly, that he is someone that would be revered. Yeah, because he was like handsome or something. He looked good. He looked good. Natsuki's sister actually says, I saw him kiss you. And she's like, I don't remember him kissing me, but I guess he may have. And she said, and I was jealous of you because how could a handsome teacher fall for someone like you? God, yeah. And in my, it, it doesn't process in her brain that this is like a 20-something-year-old man kissing an 11-year-old girl and doing inappropriate things to an 11-year-old girl, which are not okay. But That's something to like realize that if for at least... Not to really excuse the sister in that moment, but also just to comprehend the fact that she was also a child. So when she saw that, witnessed her sister being abused, like, so as a child, she can't fully comprehend it. But like when Natsuki tried to tell her mother and her mother's like, no, you're just a pervert. You must have perceived it wrong. Like, what is fucking wrong with you? Like, that is, that's more horrifying. (laughs) Yeah. But I I mean, mean, the the horror to me in this is just the abuse that she deals Mm -hmm. with. Like, the most horrific part is definitely, there's other parts that made me wince is like seeing daily, a verbal, and even in the case of the shoe, like, you know, getting like abused by her parents. And then of course, what happens to her with the teacher is like, is like, is horrific to me. Mm -hmm. So when you're dealing with that and then you get to her and you having this like they're they're just kids and they do this thing and i'm like but yeah that's where that's where you find some of the wholesomeness which is fascinating to me is that you kind of have to take what you can get when you're dealing with uh, this dark of a situation with with natsuki so i decided to look up sayaka maranta Uh, she's a 43 year old woman living in japan and this is her second book that was translated into English. Her first one is Convenience Store Woman, which I did read and really liked. And it, that book is very short. It's simple. And it has a lot of the same themes, the theme of being pressured to want to have a baby or get married, even though she doesn't want that, um, having to fit in this certain mold. Conform. Yeah. Conform. Convenience Store Woman was a big hit as soon as it became, uh, as soon as it was published in English. When Earthlings came out, apparently, uh, I, I had mentioned, like, some people were like, Sayaka, you sick fuck. And they're like, how did this book fuck me up? And I read an interview with her. She's like, it's funny because um, all these people are so surprised after reading Convenience Store Woman. Which is funny because this is, this is my 11th book. So all my other books are kind of similar to Earthlings. <laughs> so if you're in Japan, it's like, oh, she's just writing what she normally does. Yeah, which is kind of a, a criticism <laughs> of society in Japan. She actually did work in a convenience store for a very long time. Mm-hmm. And, and it wasn't until, like, this book came out in 2018. She was still working in a convenience store, I believe, till like, 2017. Oh, wow. And it wasn't until, like, fans started approaching her and she was being recognized that she realized, okay, I can't do this anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, she, it was something that she realized. She's like, I tried to become this cute girl that everyone wanted me to be or everyone expected me to be, and I hated it. And mm. that does uh, come clear in her writing, for without a doubt. You know what's funny? Actually, on that same note, and kind of going back to talking about Natsuki's sister, you you hear from her perspective, you know, her basically being told by people that she was, what did, what did they call her? What were the insults that were flung at her? Oh, like, was didn't she have a hair, like, had a hair on her face or something like that? Or? People said she was, like, a hairy and she was ugly and... People at the place where their mother worked kept referring to the mother as, like, a Godzilla. And, like, it's pervasive on all these different places, and a lot of people are just able to kind of shrug it off. But, yeah, you can see, like, the the self-loathing kind of crop up in different places, too. And then what happens? It gets paid forward instead of handled in any way, because that's the way it, it, it is. At least that's the inter- that's what I got from it, you know? There is a bit of... Because, um... like, you know, what happens when, when the word gets out about the affair with the sister is that she blames Natsuki. And yeah. Natsuki had nothing to do with that information getting out, but she's also the one who held on to the information that I have had evidence for all these years that you murdered that teacher, and I kept it secret. So now, because I blame you irrationally for this happening to me, I'm going to contact the people whose, uh, whose son you killed and see just see what happens. And they show up literally trying to kill them. Oh, trying yeah. Trying to kill her. They, like... Natsuki wakes up being essentially brained with a golf club. Yeah. I'm glad they ate those people. (laughs) 
That was I mean, actually I about mean, the point in the book I, where I'm like, yeah. I was I in, can't. I was, eh, okay, cool. They ate some people. Let's go there. That was fun. Um, I mean, <laughs> I... No, it was just, it just not that they ate people. It was the conversations they had and the rationalizations that they had to do it that I was like, it was like weird. Like, again, it was like weird. Like, well, we can't waste food. And I'm like, good on you. <laughs> I will say there were definitely two moments where I laughed out loud, like literally laughed out loud. Um, and one was, I think when they started contemplating whether jizz would be like a sustainable substance that they could eat. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, and then I think the other part was when they're like, probably about the the how to like cook or eat people. I don't think that was it. Something else made me really laugh out loud. It was, but it was all yeah. like towards the end. Mm-hmm. I feel like the ending was the more for me the more easily readable parts and much more interesting parts because it begins to me like with the. Here's horrifying, terrible things that happened to this child. Middle part is her trying to adjust and trying to want to fit in. And then the ending is just, hey, let's start our commune and just go bumfuck wild, shall we? Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I don't know, that third part is a lot of fun. Whether or not it's it this is actually real or if it's just a shared delusion, I like how you kind of see them all trying to figure out how to embrace this. And that's what I think is very interesting. It's funny because in the beginning, I, I was thinking it's going to be one of those books that I like, oh, is she actually an alien? Is she not? Are you supposed to not know? And in the, in the beginning, it's like, there's no doubt. I think this is all a delusion. But as it goes toward the end, I don't think it matters. It really doesn't matter that it's a delusion. They believe it to be real. Mm-hmm. They so strongly believe it to be real that it kind of just becomes real. It helps that like, she finds people who are kind of predisposed to this, like Tamoya, who I thought was, I didn't know he was going to be as involved in the plot as I do, but he was fascinating. He almost became the one who pushed them both toward this life in a certain mm-hmm. point. He became kind of the arbiter for change for them. Oh, I just remembered. The first part that made me burst out was when he's like, I'm going to go have sex with my grandfather. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. that's right it was grandfather I thought it was well it was at first first it was his grandfather because his grandfather's in a coma and he's like so he won't care right because he's unconscious and then they're like no that's actually kind of not cool consent should be a thing and so he's like okay I will go and ask my brother then <laughs> I will go ask my brother for consensual sex <laughs> It, but it, it's so funny because, like, there, you. It, I was like, oh, I wonder how he's gonna feel when he discovers that you and Natsuki had slept together or got married. And he was like, oh, yeah, that's normal, sure. And I'm like, yeah, okay. No, now getting to know Tamoya. <laughs> None of this can be any worse than the banality that is the factory. Mm-hmm. That was the whole like factory thing was definitely like I can see how in some cultures it's definitely pushed on you a whole lot more ourselves as our we are just you know complaining about our 30 something age not really complaining yeah. but you know making comments about it like we do being at that age where you're kind of like expected to like have that job and the home and the kids you know and we don't like i think the three of us all have decided we're not having kids right and so there was a lot mm-hmm. of like relatable stuff in that like yeah we're not functional components of the factory and you know yeah not entirely our fault but capitalism <laughs> Uh, I was looking up, I was trying to look up, um, basically I was trying to look up an article with an interview with Sayaka Murata about Earthlings just to see her thoughts and feelings. And I actually came across an article that says how Earthlings represents queerness. I don't think she intended this. I really don't think she intended this book. Uh, the idea of them being pop and boppias, boppians, I, pop and pop and boppians. Pop pin boppians. Pop, pop and pop boppians. There you go. I feel like that should, like, be in the description just pop and pop boppians! <laughs> <laughs> Exclamation point. Um, anyway. In the, in, in this episode, we become pop and bop pop, pop it, fuck. <laughs> I had it. Pop and pop boppians. There you go. There, someone made a uh, comment that, like, them trying to be pop and pop boppians is kind of the same as people who embrace themselves as being queer and then now having to live in a world that doesn't accept them and decide you know what then we're just gonna live our lives outside of society again i don't think she intended that at all but it is an interesting thought it's an interesting parallel you could definitely as like if you're a queer person have had experiences like that it could yeah that's another way that makes this narrative relatable now i i am grateful I'm genuinely grateful that I don't have family members or in-laws who are like, so when are you having kids? 
Yeah. I, I am grateful for that. Because, um, yes, you are right. Say neither Dave and I want to have kids. But I know plenty of people who any they who make jokes all the time. They're like, as soon as they got married, they're like, so when am I having grandbabies? And it's just like, really? The, it's the norm. It's the expected norm that you're going to have kids. And, you know, for, for our generation and the next, that was made even harder to do. Like, I actually do want to have a child. I just don't think it's morally <laughs> acceptable to have one when you can't assure where we're going to be in like 20, 30 years. Like, I don't even know if I could promise my child clean drinking water in like 30 years. So why would I bring a kid into this world? Can I adopt one day? Maybe I will. I want to try, but I have to be in a place where I can sustain a child still. And I can't do that in ca- this capitalist society. So in this capitalist hellscape. Right? So no way we're going to have kids. Isn't that what the factory is? It's basically a capitalist hellscape. Yeah. Right? They want us to have kids so they have more workers but you know you know let's just fuck it all we're going to pop and pop up yeah yeah we gotta find the spaceship though build one yeah let's build one I, I like how around all this darkness is this weird whimsy and that i think is what makes the book special mm-hmm. i think the pop and pop honestly it is the pop and pop 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 part that makes that keeps that whimsy or because it's the idea that they hold on to this belief that they are aliens from another planet and it's the only reason that they can't just fit in. Exactly. Like, I, I, I feel bad because, like, while you is trying to, like, adjust to it and be like, no, this is just a thing from our childhood, and yet brings up that thing where, like, well, I used to feel like I could hear people's uh, voices ahead of time and just obey them, like, psychically. And again, you can't, we don't know for sure if that's true or not with, with you, but, like, all of them to a degree, and Tamoya very vehemently feels like, we, they, they both of them try very hard not to fit in. They don't want to. Natsuki wants to. Natsuki feels like I would just be happier, be better off if I could go be brainwashed. But now I see that that's impossible. I can't live like the way they want to live, even though I want to, even though I want to just let it go. Mm-hmm. And I, there's, there is something mm-hmm. sad about that, you know, it's that also, realizing that you're so different, but you don't want to be different, but it's, it's, it can't be held. It's also realistic too. I yeah. mean, I mean, growing up, that was something that I dealt with as well. I wanted so badly to fit in and feel normal and not so isolated. And it wasn't until I was an adult and I realized, oh, there are other people that have similar interests to me. And there are people who can't are odd and actually can live, de- like, nor- not normalized, but, like, happy lives. Yeah. It, it's not just following a specific way. We were all kids that kind of grew up in the 90s slash 2000s. And there was there were stereotypes that were really pushed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. At least at, at least for me. Like the whole idea of, oh, this is how girls should act. This is how boys should act. Stay in your lane. Stay in, yeah. Even this with, is a weirdo. This is a jock. This is a, yes. labels, 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 labels. Oh gosh, the, the number of times when I would watch TV shows and I would, I had glasses and this is a one simple form. And everyone who wore glasses was always that nerdy character who everyone was like, wow, they just are so ugly. And it's not until they lose the glasses that suddenly, oh my God, they're so attractive. It, so it, that was that whole like, wow, why can't I look normal? Why do I have to be cursed with glasses? And then I learned later on, 88% of Americans need glasses. I, I looked this up. Sayaka's Murata is 43. And it was definitely more prevalent for her in Japanese culture when she was younger. Apparently, as time has changed mm-hmm. in Japan, apparently uh, more women are in the workforce. There isn't really that push. But it's still there. It's still strongly there. I wouldn't say it's like gone away in the sense that it's like changed a bit. Because, yes, there are, like, women in the workforce, but there's still, like, really strong image of, like, this is what's pretty and what's acceptable. And, like, you know, they're pushed to conform. Because it's definitely a whole lot of, like, like individualism is such a big thing in, the in like, Western culture. Yes. But in Japan, it's about the group. It's about conforming to the group. And I've noticed there is pros and cons to individualism. And the same with the idea of the group. Mm-hmm. I always think about... The stark contrast between Bioshock and Bioshock 2. <laughs> the idea of ideals being taken to extremes. First game being about Ayn Rand's form of individualism mm-hmm. versus the complete abandonment of self, social 
call that's in the second game. Like, it, it's probably why Bioshock 2 didn't do it very well. It was very cookie cutter. Well, rather than exploring the idea of, like, American exceptionalism and and bigotry that came in uh infinite later yeah but that's that's something else entirely i just i just think about that the the stark contrast there one of the things about western culture with individualism is yes we're given the freedom to be able to choose our own path however there is that sort of you're on your own figure it out yourself it doesn't really have that community feel that eastern culture has or other cultures have Oh, yeah, and some people, of course, believe in individualism until that individualism is something they don't like, and then they go, don't be like that. Be like us. Be individual, but in the way we want you yeah. to be an individual. That's, yeah, that's also a problem here. I have a couple of questions from uh, readers uh, from our Discord channel. All right. If uh, you want to join in on these discussions, about, we do have book discussions, uh, you can join our Discord by... Um, signing up for our Patreon for specifically it's Midnight Mirror and Era, but this supports all creative horror network uh, podcasts. So don't be surprised if, if that particular Patreon goes through a little bit of a rebranding uh, later on, I've got some plans. I kind of, kind of keep them under wraps a little bit, but I got some plans that are going to be kind of formally announced and brought to the surface around October as we do Midnight Marinara's 10th anniversary. That's just an early, like, hey, go support the Creative Horror Network, uh, other podcasts. Yeah. We're doing that a bit early. Usually I do this at the end, so. Well, we might as well put it in there now. We got, uh, obviously, this show, Midnight Marinara, Undercooked Analysis, to the Jameson tapes, and, of course, archive shows like Trick or Track and The Witching Hour. We have questions from our uh, one of our listeners, Bringer. Thank you, Bringer. First off, I need that ending explained. What a wild way to end the story. It's a very David Lynch kind of ending, <laughs> in my opinion. <laughs> it's vague. I'm actually curious. Why? Because the families do comment, like, why are your belly so swollen? And their belief is that they're pregnant. When you have, like, really bad malnutrition, I think it's usually, like, like a protein deficiency. Your stomach will, like, retain, like, water and moisture. Oh. And, like, you're, you're just, you, it swells. And you're so yeah. bloated that you look like you're pregnant. Like, if you remember... Those old, I mean, I'm sure they're still on there. I just don't watch cable TV. Those, like, ads of, like, you know, 10 cents a day will feed poor, yeah. starving child. You know how you always saw them with those bloated bellies? That's what it I, is. You know what? Because all they've been eating is people. That's right. I didn't think about that. <laughs> David. <laughs> Sorry, I thought David was joking that the children were eating people. And we're like, no, he probably <laughs> means the characters. <laughs> Yes, yes. Remember, feed close. the starving children because all they can eat is <laughs> other people. <laughs> um, yeah, so that's like an actual thing. So I think that's what it was. I remember those, but it, again, it's been a hot minute since I've watched cable and saw those commercials. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you're right. I completely forgot about that. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Because at first I, there was a point where I'm like, wait, is this like is Sayaka being like, oh, this could be real? I, what? And then I realized- Part oh, of me wants to- Part of me wants it to be real. Yeah. They did spend a bunch of time, as far as we know, like snacking on each other and apparently being no worse for the wear. In that scene, I don't think they were actually physically eating each other. I think they were just like licking and, and nibbling and, you know, yeah. tasting each other. Yeah. Not actually taking chunks of flesh and eating. Yeah. I mean, I've kind of figured that was the case. It was heightened. We're getting, again, we're, we're hitting peak unreliable narrator at this point. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. Although the, I, there was one point where it said, I, as I was gnawing on his eyelid, uh, and, and I was like, oh, David. You never nod on uh, David's eyelid while <laughs> smooching and stuff? <laughs> yeah, gnawing on my eyelid while I whisper sweet nothing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> He won't even let me put eye drops in his eyes. Ah, like, oh my god. No. They're mine. I would drive you insane if you were around when I have to pull strings out of my eyes. Oh. Uh, <laughs> I wear contacts. Stop. I, I like I, I have I wear contacts. He anytime that I'm about to put um, my contacts in, he's like, nope, and turns around. I turn away. He turns away. Oh he my can't. god. Look, listen, I am very paranoid about things happening to my eyes. I hate seeing things happen to eyes. Eyes are important, okay? And then I'm always going after eyes in D&D &D for yeah, some reason. Yeah, but that's, that's, I can PG that image and just be like, we cut away. <laughs> There's a reaction shot. We cut back. Creatures <laughs> clutching at their eye, you know? I don't need to see that. I don't need to see that Salvador Dali shit, okay? That scarred me for life. <laughs> Fuck you, Salvador Dali. Fuck you. Oh, I forgot about that. 
Thank you for reminding me. So, uh, Bringer also says, I wonder if we are supposed to treat the narrator as unreliable. Yes. yes. Yeah, that is. But then I also feel that some of the events are in reality. Yes. Uh, yeah, they are. But I think it, it is because it, the narrator is unreliable. We see things through her point of view. And all we can do is just kind of accept it. And at, at, like I said, at a certain point, it really doesn't matter. Because to her, it's real. To them, it is real. Yeah. Why does the stuffed animal stop talking to her? I think it was a point in her life where she was, maybe it wasn't working as a coping mechanism anymore because she was beginning to doubt, like, did I kill a witch or did I kill my teacher? And I think it would became an easier way of, like, coping with what she'd done if she was just, like, I defeated some evil and P.U. is can rest now. Yeah. Kinda. I don't know. I think it was part of the coping mechanism. Yeah, I, I agree with that, honestly. That was the way I saw it. Anyone want to try Sour Doc? I will try it. I kind of do. The amount of, like, leafage that I end up eating just because we're stuff we grow at home. Yeah, because we now have a lemon tree. I, I actually use a lot more lemons when I'm cooking because it, it's so easy to pluck it. and. Yeah, lemons rule. Yeah. And then he says, what do you make of her taste coming back? Is this something that can happen or has it always been in her head? So this is definitely PTSD. Yeah. Her being able just to embrace this new life and to be able to fully escape what has happened. And even, honestly, unfortunately, killing his parents and murdering them kind of stop, takes away that connection that she had. In a weird way, it's, if you think about it in a very, like, base level, it's like, I have just, I have ingested the the bodies of, of the those who birthed the person that took this thing away from me it's yeah. like conquest almost that is actually kind of interesting because i don't i didn't get the sense that she like really made that connection of like these are the parents of the man who took you know my sense of taste away no yeah. but it is interesting that when she eats their flesh she gets her sense of taste back that is i didn't make that connection that's kind of interesting i don't think she automatically thinks that no 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 that's no that's that's me imposing yeah she doesn't stop yeah. to think about it. she's just like oh my gosh i can taste i can taste again mm -hmm. and then she doesn't think more than that on it but from a psychological level that's me literally in this moment going aha that's kind of interesting because there is that connection it's not just anyone that she eats it's the pedophile's parents yeah, that's true. And all the things that her reactions and things that happened to her after the fact, this is all very normal. Unfortunately, it's very normal things that happen yeah. after such a traumatic event. Not to mention she gets her hearing in her right ear back. That's the other thing that happens too. Yeah. Oh yeah, because he whispered into the right ear. Yeah, and it apparently like damaged the hearing in her right ear, as, at least as she saw it. That was a moment, a triumphant moment. When that happened, I was like, however fucked up someone might perceive this she is healing because of this experience mm. as weird as it is she yeah, she is healing and she has you and uh, tamoya to thank, help thank for that too and then he says this book literally had me hooked as i had no inkling of what would happen next fair i'm glad you know i'm glad it was hooked for you bringer i actually read it all in one sitting i was i was hooked too this was great i really we we, we started off really strong didn't we mm -hmm. yeah I listened to all seven hours of it yesterday. <laughs> um, when I first started reading it, I couldn't put it down. But then there was a point I thought, okay, I have to stop. I thought I, it would be one of those books that I would just read little bit by little bit over a course of time. But I realized, no, this is something, a book that I will probably need to devour all at once. Yeah. Uh, pun intended. <laughs> um, hey, look, we're still a ways away from uh, Tender is the Flesh, but I still think about that book sometimes. So I read a third of it in the beginning, and then I read the other two for thirds about a couple weeks ago. So mm. We also have another comment from Dan. Thank you, Dan. I really love the story. I keep thinking about it. It was wonderful. It was brutal. I enjoyed the swabs of gray, the way the story toys with morality and gives very few clear stances on anything. Total freedom is both lovely and dangerous. I thought at a point there was going to be a more clear-cut message, and I was glad that I was instead left with frayed edges and unanswered questions. I like when a story can skillfully present a series of circumstances and not overly moralize them or tell a reader how to feel. I don't know that anyone in this book was in the right for very long. Agreed. I liked how the author touched on being an outsider yearning to be brainwashed. I feel like that isn't addressed enough in media. There's plenty of, I pretended to fit in until I came to terms with myself, but there's not always a legitimate non-judgmental presentation of desperately wanting normalcy despite oneself to willingly stand in line for the lobotomy. Ooh, that's mm. a, ooh, Dan. Nice. He asks, 
What did you make of the silkworm themes? I keep think, trying to tie things in the book back to the silkworms, but I'm not sure if I was overdoing it. No, I think there's something to be said about the silkworms because there, so there is a silkworm room in the house and it keeps getting brought up. I think there, the, there is a parallel to the factory. The idea that the silkworms are brought in to feed and then, you know, produce the silk that, and the only reason they're kept around is so they can produce the silk. Then eventually they hatch and fly away. And there's a metamorphosis angle to that too. But, you know, then they breed more silkworms to keep the process going, ah. which makes a profit for the people who collect the silk. So they make space for them and they set it up for them so that they can do what they need to do. Okay, I can see that. I, that's I, the way, That's my takeaway from it. I don't know that much about silkworms. I'm not really, I'm not someone who studies bugs. I try to avoid them if I can, so. There's definitely, like David's saying, a parallel of like, you know, silkworm breeding for silk and relating that to the concept of the factory. I was kind of also seeing it as like, it was in this house where they house the silkworms and the silkworms, you know, they'll go through their like metamorphosis. It's in the same house that their three characters go through their own metamorphosis. Mm -hmm. And like them kind of like clustering together in their bedding, their white cotton bedding is kind of like, you know, them in their cocoons going through their own metaphor metamorphosis kind of. So in this like same house, they themselves are like becoming like the silkworms in like that they're, you know, transforming to something else into popping pump puppies. <laughs> I don't know. That's that's kind of where I was taking it. I think it's both. I think you could read both yeah. into that. I because yeah, I, yeah. I definitely felt like the end of it, the end of the story felt like they were hatching from a cocoon. Like they were finally becoming what they wanted to be. Because they talk about emerging from their spaceship and going out into the world, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Much in the same way a silkworm eventually becomes a, you know, a moth. I found the sister to be a fascinating character by the end. Did your view of her change by the end of the book? I think my view of her is that she was just an, a normal person that got spoiled and it's just a big part of the factory. I think she had her own issues. Unfortunately, her sense of relief came from the fact that her mom catered to her. When she's at school, she's dealing with people calling her names and all that. But then at home, she's if she says, I don't like this place, I want to leave, there, her mom says, okay, we'll do that for you. It, it does influence her personality as an adult. I think the interesting part was the re realization that she knew what was going on the whole time, but never said anything, but mm -hmm. then kept it as leverage in a weird way. Well, like, the reason she kept it in the first place was because she's like, no one's ever going to want the sister of a murderer, right? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah. So they were both obviously experiencing different traumas, but the way that they react to it is, is different in that, like, Kisa was, like, playing the victim and then, like, figured out how to work the system into her favor. Like, there's the whole bit where she's, like, grew into, like, an ideal component for the factory. She kind of pretended to be in a way, or she kind of just let it happen, but... I mean, she still had an affair on her husband, and that's a no-no for a good, dutiful wife. Mm -hmm. She really still didn't fit as a part of the cog. She still, it, it's enough that she could be perceived, but on the inside. And that's kind of the, I mean, originally with Natsuki and Tomoya, that's how it kind of seemed that way. They were a married couple, even though it was just basically they were roommates, almost friends. But to the rest of the world, it's like, okay. She's doing what she's supposed to be doing. They're they're just supposed doing what they're supposed to be doing. They're mar married and they're working. And now they just have to com uh, complete the final step and have a baby. And then we have one final question, which is more of a silly question. What order are the three of you going to cannibalize each other in? <laughs> oh, man. We've had this conversation before, haven't have we? we like, have we off? talked about, like, oh, if we got into a situ situation where we have to eat each other, who <laughs> we eat first? I, wasn't it uh, the idea of like, well, whoever dies first, I guess. I, yeah. yeah. I mean, I've got reserves on me for sure. No offense, but I'm pretty sure I could outlast <laughs> <laughs> you guys. I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go first. Let's be honest. You can all. Y'all can eat me first. There's not gonna be much to subsist on, though. I am a bean pole. <laughs> uh, but I mean, yeah, like. I, I never got like, oh, who's going to eat who first? It's like, well, whoever dies first, I guess, because like... Tell you what, I'll give you each a, a big toe to start with. You would... <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's huge. Hard pass. My big toes are huge. Okay? If we were in a frozen wasteland, <laughs> like it was that sort of situation. Yeah, I mean, I I'd probably... Actually, that would be tricky. Uh, no, nah, no, nah, I'll stay. I'll stick, I'll stick in my guns. Big toe. 
But I think we we agree. It's like if you have to, eat, if you need to eat one, eat me to survive, then at least. Yeah, but only yeah. Don't don't please don't murder me to survive. Yes, don't murder me. Eat to me survive. if I die. But if you need to, if if necessary. <laughs> if and if necessary, I listen at. Listen, I'm one of those people who, who always notes, yeah, if I die, do whatever with my organs. I don't give a shit. So, yeah, if I die and you're all like, hmm, that looks good, yeah, go for it. I mean, I'm an organ donor, so. Or I'm going to, if I, like, I, I have the organ donor thing on my card. Same. Yeah, same. Yeah, so if, if whoever kicks it first, you know, we're already done. We, it's on our, it's on <laughs> yeah, our cards. It's on our so. cards. We're card carrying. <laughs> Here, just do whatever. Yeah. <laughs> put, me on a, put me on a platter and serve me up. Give my heart to someone who needs it. Give my spleen to someone who needs it. Oh, it's like that song, you know, please don't bury me down in the cold, cold ground. I'd rather have them cut me up and pass me all around. <laughs> That's all the questions we have. Do we have any final thoughts? I wonder if life on Pop and Popapia is a lot more anime-like oh, God. than it is here. How much you want to bet it is very Sailor Moon slash Cardcaptor Sakura slash every other magical girl thing. I mean, who knows? They they sent Natsuki. They made Natsuki into a magical yep. girl. They sent Pia to be her guide. Who is a, a plush hedgehog, which is adorable. Yeah. I'm, like I said, I think I said all my thoughts earlier, but I am very, I'm very happy with this book. It's challenging to read in some places because I really don't want to read about some of these things. But ultimately, I think that it's just, it's a really strong read. It's a really good read. I, I'm glad we started with this one. I, I knew Sayaka Murata's writing was good because I did read Convenience Store Woman. And funny enough, I remember when I read it, I went to I, I went to you and I'm like, there's some horror elements here. I wonder <laughs> if she's ever written horror or plans to write horror. And then this book comes out and everybody's like, it's a horror. And I'm like, awesome. Hey, y'all, keep uh, reading and keep uh, writing about the banal horror that is capitalist society. Oh, man. I hope yeah. uh, her other books get translated into English. There's another book that has been translated into English. Is I think it's a collection of short stories, and this just happened, I want to say, a couple years ago, or mm-hmm. the, recently, mm-hmm. or last year. I can't, I'm not quite sure, but so far, only three of her books have been translated, and she's written 12 books, and I'm like, damn. ah, I want to read more of her work. She's a great writer. It would be great to have more translated stuff from her but it does definitely take a lot of consideration into like the translating like i they kept natsuki who called herself a magician when the concept was not really a magician it was a magical girl which if you watch anime you know what a magical girl is and that's definitely a, a much more recognized concept in like japanese like media. maho shoujo the maho sho- yeah maho shoujo and even like their idea of like uchujin like aliens it's different than in yeah. the West. So, like, I, those were things that I'm like, oh, they didn't, they translated, like, I guess that makes sense for the translation, but, like, I was like, mm, the concept is off, yeah. though. Yeah, because she's, she's not a magician. It's definitely a magical girl. Yeah, because if you weren't, or if you don't know, like, what a magical girl is, you'd be like, okay, what, if she's a magician, why does she have a mirror and, like, I guess the wand makes sense. But the mirror? Yeah, you know, you think Sailor Moon and her transformation mm-hmm. locket kind of thing. Yeah, and she so. has a wand. She, you can picture in her own mind... Like, doing the whole transformation sequence. Mm-hmm. And it would make sense. You know, there's a lot of, like, Maho Shoujo uh, anime for, for kids. So it makes sense that as a child, this is how she's going to cope, is by taking this concept from a kid. Oh, absolutely. That she's familiar with. But anyway. <laughs> Good book. Good book. Speaking of translated books, here's my segue into what book we're going to be reading next. And you probably should know, because we've already announced all uh, six books. So, but in case you don't, the next book we'll be reading is Our Share of Night by uh, Mariana Enriquez. I should let you know, it is a very long book. Mm -hmm. If you haven't started reading it, start reading it now. Uh, There is an audiobook for it, and it's 25 hours long, so. (laughs) Dave and I actually bought the book. It's sitting very prominently on our bookshelf. I can see it right now. Yeah, and it's beautiful. I love the cover. Um, I've already read a little bit of it, and I will be very interested to see where it goes. In fact, that's the nice thing. Since you all know about the books that we have ahead of time, read them as you will, but just know that we're going to be discussing this next month. As I mentioned before, uh, check out our other podcasts on the Creative Horror Network. You can find us at creativehorror.com or on our YouTube channel. And guess what? All of the uh, Darkly Lit episodes are now on YouTube. You can listen to every Darkly Lit episode on YouTube. Yes. Feel free to check those out if, uh, if you'd like. How would you guys feel like going on a uh, on a road trip? Let's 
Let's go to the mountains. Go stay in a cabin. Okay, but only if I can stay in the silkworm room. Wow, I'm so excited. Good golly gosh, I want to see the silkworm room. <laughs> oh, I just want to see it at least once Pop before I die. <laughs> Time to lick your eyelid. No! Good evening, intrepid listeners. This is the Pasta Shade, the host of Midnight Marinera, and this podcast is part of creativehorror.com, a network of podcasts and creators working together to build a constructive community of horror fans. For more content like this, visit us at creativehorror.com. <laughs>